Hi, I'm Roz Naylor. I direct the Center on Food Security and the Environment at Stanford University. And today we're kicking off our symposium on food and nutrition security for the 2016-2017 season. And we've got a, a set of talks on aquaculture, food security, and the environment. So today I have Dave Little, Professor of Aquatic Resource Sciences and Development from Sterling University. And just going to ask Dave a few questions uh, as part of his talk. Welcome, Dave. Thanks, Ross. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, it's so fun to have you here because you've had 35 years of experience in the tropics, all over the world, really, and you trained so many students. How did you get into the field, oh. and uh, what was your story? Well, I, uh, I was trained as a marine biologist, and then I was sent to a very landlocked, dry place up in the northeast of Thailand a long time ago now, in the early 1980s. And I just got stuck in working with a government department as a, as a volunteer of voluntary service overseas, like American Peace Corps, really. And, um, yeah, I spent a few, two years there, two and a half years there, working in rural development, really, in, in extension of aquaculture to farmers. And you stayed in Thailand, it sounds like. Yeah, I came back for a while, and then I, I got a, a longer term, well, first of all, it was a PhD based at the Asian Institute of Technology in, in Bangkok, and that had a... A, a, a program in aquaculture very much geared towards the countries of Asia and I did my PhD there on intensive systems for tilapia fry production and I got involved in all sorts of other things and just one thing led to another and I stayed there a long time so and uh, had a fantastic time uh, great students great staff great friends yeah it's so interesting because um, you are trained as a marine biologist, and you mm -hmm. have a lot of science training in aquaculture, but you're really looking a lot at the impacts of aquaculture on society and on poverty alleviation. Yeah. How, how do you feel like the field of aquaculture has changed over this period, and what do you see as some of the big successes that you've seen yeah. in those areas? Yeah, well, I think it's been a, it's been a very interesting journey, really. There's, there's been just fantastic growth in the sector, but I think... Where it's having most impacts are where we see it going, being part of communities and really impacting, not just on farmers, but the products in the shops, people working in the value chains are benefiting through employment and, and, and having an autonomy. You know, they're not just in, employed by one large company, for example. So we've got great diversity if we look around, if we take Asia Pacific as a, as a region, but of course globally there's just great diversity and there's lots and lots of opportunities for people to get involved and for the products themselves. So if you go to an area in Asia, say in Thailand or Cambodia or Bangladesh, Bangladesh might be a great example because mm -hmm. it's so poor. Mm -hmm. What would be an example of some real food security benefits mm -hmm. as well as a system that's really working well? What do you see when you get to the field? Well, it's just, it, it, absolutely, if you take one country, I mean, Bangladesh has transformed itself. Um, I mean, from a 20, 25 years ago, a country had been very dependent on, on, on natural fish stocks. Uh, it's a fast-growing country, a lot of pressures on its natural resource systems. It's a country of waters, obviously. And what the Bangladeshis have done is really transform their market so that probably more than 50% of the fish they now eat comes from some sort of culture system. And there's a lot of variety of culture systems there. Some are pretty, they're really enhanced fisheries, but they really applied... Um, you know, science, they've applied the, the concepts of how you do it and have come up with a sector that is, is really interesting and having big societal impacts. People are eating more fish in Bangladesh now because it's cheap and it's cheap because it's being produced efficiently by a whole host of different people. So it's very exciting. Yeah, so if, if they're growing shrimp and people, there's a polemic out there that shrimp are terrible somehow, yeah. Uh, is this true in Bangladesh, and um, are people actually benefiting from shrimp, even these yeah. poor poor producers? Um, who eats the shrimp that are yeah. produced? Well, yeah, the, 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 that's that's an interesting question. I mean, we, I think we've, we're just used to buying shrimp in a bag in the West, and it's marketed as shrimp. And, you know, maybe we hear that tropical shrimp's really not good and we shouldn't be eating it, but there's lots of different types of shrimp grown in lots of different ways. And, and it's... You know, um, it's, it's as different to your, your feedlot chicken compared to a, a chicken that's running around the farmyard in terms of what we see in Bangladesh. Bangladesh and other parts, some parts of Asia, still have very extensive production. And this is on usually on converted low-quality rice land. 
Um, there haven't been lots of mangroves chopped down to support this type of aquaculture. And um, it, you know, the, in southern Bangladesh, we, there's something between 200 and 300,000 people dependent on these systems. And when we think of them being shrimp systems, when we buy our shrimp in the shop, actually in growing that, a lot of other things have come out of those quite extensive ponds. And they've really contributed to food security in Bangladesh, in those communities wider afield in Bangladesh, because they're shrimp plus lots of other things that local people eat as well. So it's complicated. I know there's still concerns about environmental and social impacts, for example. Does, you know, saline shrimp ponds, does that make these, does it make adjoining land more, more saline? I think it's really locally, contextually uh, dependent on what's going on at the local. It, it, what we see in the newspaper reports is it's all like this. Well, it's certainly not all like <laughs> it. And I think on balance, there's a lot more positives coming out of that type of development than there are negatives. And I think, uh, as we've clocked it through time, I think actually what we see is local people are, if they ever lost control, are regaining control in those areas and making those systems more of their own, which is very encouraging. And I think we need to support them and I think we need to work with them. We need to keep buying their shrimp, but we also need to work with them to see how we can make those systems even more sustainable. So what are the poorest households eating? Are they going to the market and buying some of this shrimp? Mm -hmm. or are they eating other kinds of fish? What are some mm -hmm. of the areas that excite you the most in terms of yeah. uh, the fish for the poor? Well, if we carry on Bangladesh for a minute, I mean, if you take the shrimp, for example, um, you, when they take the shrimp out, the harvest of shrimp out, there'll be local indigenous species of fish which are locally eaten. There'll be stocked fish, sometimes from hatcheries, depending on where you are, whether it's a saline or less saline system. And um, they all really contribute, not just to food security, but high quality food nutrition. Um, if you take the shrimp, the tails are what we eat in, in Europe and North America. And the heads and the legs, they're staying locally and actually they've got more micronutrients in than the tails have. And they're staying and they're being used for poor people's feed, food, food in Bangladesh itself. So you've got to look at the whole animal and you've got to look at the whole system to really get an idea where these impacts are. And, it's overwhelmingly positive. Yeah, it's interesting because we never really think about uh, the full animal and, yeah. and how it's split up and used by yeah. different income groups and different. Yeah. And we also don't think so much about the small fish that may be residual in these systems or in yeah. surrounding systems. Uh, the fish that we think of sometimes as feed or that are just don't have any economic value but might yeah. have a lot of value in yeah. these systems to poor people? Well, I think they're preferred. You yeah. know, I mean, it's not, it's not just that when we see a small fish, we, we see something of very little value. But um, poorer people in countries like that see it as food, first and foremost. And I think we sometimes miss stuff, you know? Yeah. For example, um, the seasonality has a big impact on the availability of fish in many of these countries. You know, they have wet, dry, cyclical climates. And uh, when it's not, when there's not much water around, they can be lean times. And of course, what's grown up is a whole sort of norm of processing fish when the times are good. And that's transferring into aquaculture as well. And the use and the, and the consumption of, of fermented and dried and salty fish is absolutely massive in many of these countries. Often something that poorer people do as an activity to earn income, but also, of course, they can be very dependent on it in, in, their, in their diets as well. And we simply don't know enough about that. Um, it's one of these sort of, uh, you know, unhidden sort of hidden stories, really. We think of fish, you go to markets and there's places that sell fresh fish, and the dried fish are somewhere else. So yeah. you, you're not even, they're not even in the same place. So we're still learning about this stuff, but we know they're important. We know there's great diversity, and we know that there are... There are issues there because what should, for example, what should fishery departments, what should companies, what should policymakers be, be doing about that to just ensure that those fish stay in the supply chain and people's nutrition stays good? Yeah, so there's all sorts of benefits yeah. here, obviously. Is it transferable to Africa? I mean, we hear so many success stories in Asia. Yeah. And Africa, just maybe 2% of global aquaculture yeah. production. Should they be developing aquaculture or should they be relying on these small fish that might be mm. resident in just natural systems? I think both. I mean, there's, there's, you're right. The, the, the level is of, of aquaculture activities tends to be much lower. There are great success stories. I mean, if we look at, for example, North Africa, Egypt, you know, 700,000 tons of tilapia in just the last few decades. Tremendous success story, mainly eaten by poor people. 
uh, on land that's not very good for anything else, you know, They're using drainage water of, of crop production. So really interesting systems. Sub-Saharan Africa, we've got well-established, capital-intensive, high input, high output aquaculture, often based on cages in, pot, in, uh, in reservoirs and lakes. And, and that's really steaming ahead. It's, it's doing very, very well. But it's a very different activity to trying to get perhaps rural farmers, perhaps at the moment growing maize or other crops, into becoming fish farmers. That's proved more difficult. And again, it depends where you are, how much success has been had and how much progress is being made. But it comes back to the same basics. People have got to know how to do it. They've got to have the resources to start doing it. They've got to have access to the seed, the juveniles. They've got to somehow feed them, whether that's producing the feed in the pond through fertilization or buying feeds and feeding them. And then they've got to have markets. And that's what we see. Markets are often the key. So where you see the really bright sparks, like, for example, Nigeria, where there's a huge industry, completely indigenous, developed out of you know, people's wish to earn a living based on African catfish. And that's because of the big urban markets in Nigeria. And that's, again, that's really growing very, very fast. Yeah, so urbanization actually may help in some cases here, very but, so. but no one size fits all is clearly the not. message, I think, is your I saying. think not. So um, in the aquaculture area more generally, there's so much pushback in terms yeah. of some of the big issues, GMOs yep. or... Uh, a lot of intensification that may lead to pollution and deterioration of water quality. What yeah. are some of the issues that keep you awake at night in yeah. terms of what could be better in aquaculture mm. now? Well, I think we're suffering many of the same challenges that food production generally face, and that is more from less. How do we produce more, maintain the quality or enhance the quality, and just get more of it, produce more of it? And, and the way we're increasingly looking at that is intensification because we need to get more out of a given area, but to try and do that in a sustainable way, so a sustainable intensification process. And, and it's the same sort of issues. You know, how can we make the use of water more efficient so we get more tons per, you know, per unit of water, more fish for the amount of feed we use? These are the, the real challenges. But where we see people in real difficulties in aquaculture very often as they've started doing that. Maybe there's a good size industry and we see this in Ghana where there's a big cage industry in Lake Volta. We see beginnings of these problems in, in Egypt. It's where intensification happens and there's not controls in, in terms of health management. And that's where it gets tricky because these are largely open systems, you know, and pathogens move around and they move through water into stocks of fish. And how do we maintain the health of our of our culture of fish. This is, this, is a, this is a big challenge. And it's not just being able to understand what the bug is and how the, whatever it is, whatever the, the disease, the bacteria, the virus, or whatever it is. It's also thinking about how can we prevent it? How can we get more biosecure systems? How can we get animals which are intrinsically more healthy and able to ward off diseases? You know, It's not like there's a silver bullet where there's always going to be a vaccine, always going to be the right drug. No, we, we learned that from animal husbands. Yeah. We learned that from ourselves. So we've got to think about how we design these systems, how we educate people and train them to start aquaculture in a way that's setting the right, if you like, standards. Um, and that's not necessarily international standards. It's how people do things. It's protocols that they can carry on doing it, learn from each other locally, and get it right. Yeah, I know. I mean, like anything else, uh, the systems can be designed perfectly, and then um, humans get involved, and they yeah. cut corners, or yeah. you know, they yeah. try to make profits too quickly, or whatever leads to yeah. maybe an oversight on some of these uh, issues of disease yeah. and excessive intensification. So that that's a really good point. So. Stanford has a lot of students interested mm. in aquaculture as really a, a tool to save yeah. wild fisheries yeah. and to meet fish demands yeah. and animal protein demands. What advice would you have for students oh. getting into this field? <laughs> if you sure. look I'm back at position. your long history. Mm, not sure. <laughs> long history. I'm not sure what I'd advise. I mean, I think that, I think, you know, there's a lot of people out. First of all, it's a global business. So, you know, be willing to travel. Be willing to go and learn from what other people are doing and, and to try and apply what you've learned here at Stanford or anywhere else you're, you're working. Be willing to share that information. This idea of sort of coalitions of learning, I think are really important, whether we're doing that as students here at Stanford or wherever, or when we go and work in other countries and how we engage with people locally and, and exchange and share that knowledge. 
Um, Open-mindedness, because, you know, aquaculture is pretty different now from it was 35 years ago. And uh, if you're still doing exactly the same thing then, you know, there wouldn't be much hope for you. You've got to move on. Um, and, of course, the realisation that it's a business. You know, we may come in because we're interested in biology. Um, or a specific area of biology. So you can do that. You can go deep. You can engage your interests and develop them. But you mustn't lose touch with the reality of it being a business. And I think that's the key thing. That's how you make yourself more useful to potential employers, make yourself more useful to people out there who are trying to do aquaculture. And they need people who've got training in it from wherever they come from, whether they're trained locally or trained here in America or Europe or whatever. So engage, and then there's lots of ways to do that. Never, never more. You know, there's always. If we look now, there's so many opportunities of where graduates go and look for employment. You know, we mentioned standards. There are international standards out there that are big employers of students. Uh, you know, the idea being that we try and bring up standards. We try and make sure value chains work well for not just the producers but the consumers as well, try and make those products more marketable, make them more saleable, make people trust in, in what's going on on the farm. To do that job, you've got to, you've got to know the technical stuff, yeah. but you've also got to be aware of all the business side of it as well. So I think that's an exciting area for people to get into. And public understanding of what we do. You know, if I look here in North America, one of the most impressive things are your, your public aquaria and your other organisations that have these you know, public information roles, fantastic, you know, and lots of jobs there as well. Yeah. And um, that's a big job for us. People have got to understand that eating fish is, is a good choice, both in terms of their own nutrition, but also in terms of, you know, supporting world development in a way. Your purchase of a sustainable product is helping a lot of people. Yeah, that's a great note to end on. And thanks so much for coming to Stanford. Really enjoying it. <laughs> okay, thanks, Ross. Thanks.